Jesus You are everything to me
shall I be afraid? I will wait on you. Yes, God, that's what I'm gonna do. I will wait on you. you. I will trust in you. I will trust in you. Sing it with me. The Lord is my light. The Lord. Trust 
trust in you, God. I'm going to trust in you, God. Yes, God, yes, God. I trust in your unfailing love. Hallelujah.
Hey, City Life Church. Well, it's Father's Day today. I want to say a big happy Father's Day to all our dads out there, as well as to say happy birthday, City Life Church. Yes, it's our 20th anniversary today. Yes, 20 years ago, Pastor Ginny and I started City Life Church in a small conference room tucked away in the corner of Lone Hill. How much has God done since then? How many thousands of people have been saved? How many lives have been changed through the faithfulness of God and through the sacrifice of so many people? I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. I know your reward is with the Lord, but I want to say thank you so much for those who have prayed, who have given, who have served, who have loved, and who have been so loyal, so faithful, and so gracious in, in, in giving so much of yourself to the building of this church and to the extension of God's kingdom. I say thank you. We're so blessed that today we celebrate 20 years of serving this community and beyond. And um, I'm just so grateful as I look toward the future and know that if God has done this over these 20 years, what's the Lord going to do over the next 20 years? So happy birthday, City Life Church. I want to read a scripture right now um, regarding uh, a giving. And um, it's found in Luke chapter 11, where it speaks about uh, if we being evil know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more our Father in heaven. And then it goes on to say, will He not give you the Holy Spirit? And I think about God as Jehovah Jireh, God as our provider. And then I think about how I am as a parent, as a father, um, when I think about the needs of my own children. And I am, I'm, uh, I'm so inspired when I, I think about that comparison because I know how much I love my own kids. And if I see that they have a need, I want to meet that need for them the best that I can. And compared to God, obviously, we are so far beneath His level of love and generosity. And sometimes I think that we as believers uh, get to a place where we think we've used up all of God's favor, all of God's miracles, all of God's supply. But the truth is, is that God is endless and inexhaustible. And His love toward us and His favor toward us is unending. And we can never ever use it all up. We can never ever run out of miracles and favor with God. And so this morning I want to freshly encourage you. God loves to give to His kids. It's who He is. God loves to it, when His children put a demand on who He is and put faith in Him as a supplier, as Jehovah Jireh, as the God who meets all of our needs, the Bible says, according to His riches in glory. Not according to our riches, not according to our level, but according to His level. And I want to encourage you right now, put a fresh demand on God. Put a fresh uh, demand on His gracious kindness on his extravagant generosity and come to him confidently before the throne of grace and say God this is my need I thank you for meeting it to be specific to be uh, uh, exacting over what it is that you have need of from your heavenly father because it's his delight to bless us not only with things but also to provide for us emotionally to provide for us spiritually, to provide for us relationally. Whatever that need is that you have, God is our Heavenly Father, and it's His delight to love His children by providing for them. So why don't we just pray right now into that. Heavenly Father, we want to thank You that You are a good Father and that You love us and that every perfect gift comes down from you but with which there's no shadow of turning oh God you are good and you're good all the time thank you Lord uh, 
for a boldness and courage to ask you, Lord, to do that which needs to be done, to give that which needs to be given, to meet the needs of your people spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, relationally, in every single way. And so, Father, we come with fresh faith and a renewed confidence that, Lord, you are Jehovah Jireh. It's who you are, and it's your delight to bless your children. And we thank you for this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Well, today being Father's Day, I thought it be a great idea to hear from my son Christian. He's got an amazing word that I believe is going to be such a blessing to you. God bless you as you receive this word from Christian Monaghan. Well, I'm super excited this morning to share with you. Uh, I've had a message on my heart for a little bit now, and uh, it, it has to do with Joseph. It has to do with Joseph. And I'm, I'm ready, man. I'm ready for this morning. I've been watching preaching for a long, long time. All right? And if there's one thing I've learned, it's that perspiration is the currency of inspiration. So I am... I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> um, I'm, I, I, I just feel so blessed and so honored having grown up in this house with the pastors that I have. Although they are my parents, they are also my pastors and the ministry that they have brought into my life, I wouldn't trade for anything. They have been an inspiration and first and foremost have modeled a relationship with Christ for my siblings and I that to this day we still draw from. My parents have been dil uh, diligent and they have been faithful and they have been servants in the house. And this is really where this message comes from. It's about process. And the title is simply Dream. Somebody say dream. dream. Turn to your neighbor say, I have a dream. dream. We're pulling that Martha Luther King Jr. this morning. Hallelujah. I have a dream. And if you don't have a dream, I believe that this morning the Lord is going to give you some very practical ways to dream again. I understand that life isn't always as we plan it to be. Man makes plans, but hallelujah, the Lord directs his steps. The only constant is change except for God, which is so amazing to me because he defies the very constant that he himself created. What a God we serve this morning. Um, I'm inspired by the story of Joseph. And uh, I believe that there is so much richness to draw from. And this morning, just before we get into it, I just want to have a recap of who he is, what he did, and what his process looked like. For those of you who know or maybe don't know, Joseph, uh, uh, Joseph was a young man when the Lord gave him a dream. And the dream was he was standing in the middle of hay bales, which represented his, his, brother, his brothers. And uh, in the dream, they all bowed down to him. And he went on and he told his, brother, uh, his brothers, and that fueled a rage within them, a hatred. Because uh, he was the youngest at the time. Imagine that. Anybody here the oldest sibling at all? Anybody? I am. I am. I'm one of four. And I know that if my little sister, who is six years younger than me, came to me one day and said, Christian, I had a dream. I'd be like, yeah, yeah, what's the dream? One day you're going to bow down to me. I'd be like, uh, <coughs> what? <laughs> let's, uh, let's hold it right there. What's going to go on? So I can begin to understand kind of like what was going on. Like, who do you think we are? that we would bow down to you. We, we come from the same place. What, what makes you so special? Yeah. We know what happens. He was thrown into a pit. The coat that his father had made for him of many colors was ripped from his back and animal's blood was poured on it. Joseph was then sold into slavery and his brothers went back to his father and told him that he was dead. The very people that were meant to care for him and love him and protect him and look after him turned on him. Man, doesn't that just sound like life? <laughs> but Joseph was faithful with what God had given him. And we see something very consistent through his journey. We see that wherever Joseph is, there is favor, there is faithfulness, and there is service. And they go hand in hand. And nowhere in this dialogue 
Do we see Joseph cry out to God and say, Lord, I am questioning your judgment for my life. How was this process serving the dream that you gave me? It's an amazing story. And as we know, he went from serving Potiphar and then he went to serve a prison sentence. And then he was the second most powerful man in Egypt after Pharaoh. What an amazing story. The things that God did in this young man's life. He was 17 when his process started. 17 years old. And it all started, hallelujah, with a dream. Well, in just thinking about how a dream is birthed, and this is the first point that I have this morning, is the birthing of a dream. Something my father has always encouraged me to do is look at the natural and look at the spiritual because they often reflect each other and there are things to draw from both. And in this case, when I thought about how do you get a dream, I began to look at the natural. And as we know, whenever you dream, you are in a place of rest, often sleep, right? So you are in a place of rest. The environment around you was calm. You have a sense of peace. And you are secure in where you are. Only in those moments can a dream come and impact your life. If you're looking for a dream in the spiritual, it is very, very similar to the natural. You've got to be in a place of rest, a place of peace, a place where the Lord can impart something to you, a place without interruption and often a place of seclusion where the Lord can minister to your heart and bring you a dream in this moment. The second thing about a dream in the natural is that the things that you experience when you are awake affect what you dream about when you are asleep. How many of you know that to be true? The things that you experience when you are conscious affect the kinds of things you dream about when you are unconscious or you're asleep. Unconscious really isn't the, because we're still conscious, not a coma. It's a, you know what I mean? You get where I'm going with that one. It's the same thing in life. It's the same thing when drawing a dream from the spiritual. The place that you are in, the environment, the circumstance, the situation will affect the dream that you are given. If you are in finance, hallelujah, anybody in finance here? Don't be ashamed. We see you. Accounting even, all right? Okay, cool. If you are in finance... You better believe that if you're asking a dream, asking the Lord for a dream in your workplace, maybe you're going to go start your own business. I seriously doubt that you're going to open up a place that sells art, right? Or does, or do, or interior design or something like that. It's going to be within your field of expertise. It's going to be where you are equipped. And the third thing, you don't get to choose what you dream about. You don't get to choose what you, how, how amazing would it be if you could though, right? Right, every night before you go to sleep, you're like, yeah, I, I want that one, right? Rainbows, okay, marshmallows, uh, uh, milk with cookies, that, that one. We can save the dinosaurs for Tuesday. I want this one tonight, right? That would be amazing. But you don't get to choose what you dream about. Joseph did not get to say to God, Lord, this is what I want my dream to look like. That's why a dream is given. Trusting God with the things and the dreams that he gives you is crucial. Because you better believe that God factors in everything. Where you are, who you are, and where you want to go. Everything is covered. And the most significant thing about finding a dream, getting a dream is to be in the house of the Father. When Joseph received his dream, he found rest, he found refuge in the house of his Father. If you want a dream this morning, church, if you have a dream, it has come from the house of the Father, intimacy with Jesus Christ, an authentic, real relationship with Him. If you are wondering, where has my dream come from? Putting it through the house of God is something that will benefit you exponentially because you will begin to realize, is this from my own personal desire or is this from the divine purpose that God has for my life? Is this, is this for my own ambition? 
Is this for myself? Have I dreamt this up based on desire, based on the things that I want? Or has God put something on my life to figure out what God has given you, the dream that he has for you? You often need to push the boundaries of your comfort zone. When we said everything is factored, God does factor everything. Your personality, your characteristics, your spiritual gifting, your natural ability, your passion, and your skill all come in to the same thing. Pushing the boundaries in the natural, pushing the boundaries in the spiritual. I know that there are people in this room, God has given you the gift of prophecy. God has given you the gift, words of knowledge. God has given you a supernatural ability to lay hands on someone and, and, and allow them to experience comfort and peace like they never have because of the spirit that is in you. How will you know what you are gifted in if you never try anything new? It's the most common thing mothers say to their children. How do you know you don't like it unless you try it? And then they still make you eat it. And sometimes that's what God does, which is the crazy thing. The thing that comes with gifting is favor. Say favor. favor. How do you know you're favored? Well, I'll tell you one thing. People with more than you are jealous of you. People look at what God has put on your life, and they become jealous and hateful like the brothers of Joseph. Meanwhile, you're sitting there like, I didn't even ask this has been put on my life. Yeah. I say, I want that. I want that. I want that. I say, this is, this is who I am. And all you can do is flow in your gift. Allow Jesus to take you from grace to grace as you take his kingdom from glory to glory. That is all you can do. And this is what Joseph was experiencing when he, was, when he encountered his brothers was a wrath and a jealousy. Why? Because he had favor with his father. He was loved. It's amazing. People will celebrate your success until it's more than theirs. <laughs> they want you to win, but not to pass them. Win down here where I can monitor the situation. But the minute God brings breakthrough and elevation... And prosperity, oh, people get nervous. People get nervous. People don't like that. The fickleness of jealousy is a marvel. Something that, as a family, we have always been very intentional about, and my parents have instilled this in all of us, in myself, uh, Jordan, Ethan, and Gracie, who are my siblings, is honing the gift that God has given us. Parents in this room, it, it is crucial for you to hone the gifts that your children have. My parents did this with us. My father invested a huge amount of time into us, as does my mother. And something that they always brought us back to, whatever it was we were passionate or skilled about, whether it was swimming or music, which is what we did as a family, they always, always had us serve in church. They always had us serve in the house of the Father. Why? Because that's where the dream came from. That's where the passion was born. And that's who gave us the skill. Serving the house with your gift is not something that will limit you. It's something that will grow you. And sometimes we get into this mentality like, I, it's like, I could do something it's so much bigger. There is no greater thing than bringing people closer to Christ Amen. through serving with your gift. Hallelujah. Amen. The second point that I have is embracing the process. Once you've been given the dream and now you know that this is from God, this is divine, this is who I am, this is what I need to pursue. I'm skilled in it. I'm passionate about it. I want to take this further. What's the next step? The Lord has given you a seed. What are you going to do with it? If you hold the seed in your hand and just admire it, it will never serve the purpose for which it was created. 
action needs to be taken. The Lord will direct you, and that is step number two. When you have the dream, and God says, this was made for you, now go with it. In um, the story of Joseph, in Genesis uh, 37, 15 to 18, we see Joseph's father send him out, but the Lord set him up. And we're going to read this together. It said, now a certain man found him, and there he was, wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, what are you seeking? So he said, I am seeking my brothers. Please tell me where they are feeding the flocks. And the man said, they have departed from here, for I heard them say, let us go to Dohan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dohan. I'm going to stop right there because I want to go back to the beginning of that scripture where it said a certain man found him wandering in a field. You can have the dream, you can have the passion, you can have the skill, but unless you have direction, everything that you put into that dream will serve no purpose because it was misdirected. Some of us have a dream, and it's the right thing from God, but in the wrong place. Some of us are toiling, toy, toiling a field that was not meant for us. And the Lord is about to insert something into your life to say, what are you seeking? And once you address that, this is where you go. Direction is key in your process. I like the second part where, where the man asked him and said, what, what exactly are are you, are you seeking? Now, we know that Joseph has had this dream. The Lord has imparted something great to him. But what was the instruction of his earthly father? Go out, seek your brothers, make sure that all is well with him. Joseph did not say to this man, I'm seeking, um, I'm seeking the fruition of my dream. <laughs> no. What did he say? He said, I'm seeking my brothers. Joseph's obedience is what brought in direction. Amen. Obedience to his father brought direction. Wow. And as Joseph followed, he was about to be propelled into the process that God had customized for him. This morning, I want to encourage you, if, if, if you have this dream and you, and you know that it's from God, check in. Ask the difficult questions. Lord, am I where I need to be right now? I want to use this gift for your glory, but am I located and situated accordingly? Am I where I need to be, Lord? God will answer you and it will be clear because he takes care of his own. The good work that he has started within you, he will be sure to see through to completion. The Lord is faithful with his servants. He said, I'm seeking my brothers. It says, now his brothers saw him afar off, and even before he came near them, they conspired against him to kill him. Man, these brothers. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, how badly do you hate this guy? What, what did he do? Oh, that just shows how powerful favor is and the effect that that can have over someone who covets the position that God has you in. Even before Joseph was near them, the Bible says that they conspired against him to kill him. To sabotage what God had, is doing with him. The enemy can see you from afar. And initially, right, it says that they wanted to kill him. But one of the older brothers says, we're not, we're not going to kill him. We're not going to kill him. We will spare the hand, but we are going to throw him in a pit. We're going to take that which he loves, that which... Our father loves, and we're going to see how well he dreams after this. So they benefited in three ways, so they thought. While he was in the pit, what they did is they saw slave traders come by, and they decided, here is our opportunity to get rid of him, make some coin, hallelujah, and still convince our father 
that he is normal. Here's what strikes me about this. I often wondered, why did they go and tell their father that he was dead? Why not just missing? Well, because if someone's missing, you go and look for them. If someone is dead, you take time to mourn for them. They did not want anyone or anything to pursue him. This was such an intentional move. This was the place where now the only people who could have found him, who could have went and saved him, are now convinced that he is dead. What did this do to Joseph? He was abandoned, lost his family. Those who he trusted had betrayed him. Those who were meant to keep him and look after him turned on him. He was restricted. He went from a dark place in the pit to shackles in slavery. Sometimes the pull of your calling is so great that you have no control over what happens. When now you're in it and there's no getting out. The doubt, man, the contradiction. Lord, you've given me this dream. You've confirmed it. You've placed a passion within me. Why is this? How is this helping me achieve what you've asked me to do? Man, the questions, the uncertainty, the separation. I tell you, um, the commitment to his process is astounding. And once he was put in shackles and sold into slavery, in the scripture it says that the Lord was with him. And this is the crazy part. He was a successful man. I read that thinking, no, no, <laughs> no. This is not a successful man. A man who has been betrayed by his family. A man who has been thrown into a pit. A man who has been sold who has now become another man's possession, is not a successful man. But after that scripture says, everything his hand touched prospered. It's not the situation or the circumstance that makes you successful. It's the faithfulness with the gifting. It's what God has placed in your life. There is also another consistency throughout the journey of Joseph, and, and that is that in his process, he owned nothing but led everything. When he was sold to Potiphar, he did not own his estate. He did not own any of his possessions, but he was placed in charge of all of it. When he was in the prison, he did not own the prison. He did not even pay off or own the guards. But he was put above the entire prison, and he was given trust. When he was elevated to the palace, he did not own Egypt. He stewarded it. You do not have to own something to be faithful with your calling. The Lord uses everything within you to accomplish His will. How powerful is that? God is so good. The thing that we notice about Joseph as well is that in the midst of his situation, the gifting that he had been given served others before it served himself. When he was in the prison... He was able to interpret the dreams of everybody else except his own. <laughs> Lord, what about the dream that you gave me first? The thing that started this entire process. Surely by now, you need to have me understand what I'm doing here to be faithful with what you've given me. And the Lord said, no, not yet. Be faithful. Be faithful with your gift. Be faithful. And through his faithfulness, we see some incredible things. Humility. When you have lost everything and you feel abandoned and the only thing you have left is your calling and your gift before God, that humbles you. 
Why? Because it's not confidence in self. It's confidence in Him. It's not confidence in your ability. You didn't even get into the process through your own works. How are you going to get out of it? Through your own works. If it's started by Jesus, it's going to be finished by Jesus. And there is nothing you can do in your own power except be faithful with your gift. With the little that God has given you. Because when you are faithful with little, you will be faithful with much. He did not get to experience the fruit of his gift before serving others with it. Even when he stewarded the possessions of Potiphar and Pharaoh. Where, where's mine? I'm looking at the story. Look, where's mine? Where, your good and faithful servant. Where's mine? Tell you what, the Lord was doing something in Joseph that he couldn't have got any other way. And when he was faithful with what the Lord had given him, it produced humility. It produced forgiveness towards those who had betrayed him because he understood that it was part of the process that God had him on. It produced diligence, which is persistence with what, with what he had. It produced accountability because when you are strapped into the yoke of your calling, and even though the burden that the Lord has put on you because of His favor is light, you are still restricted. Accountability often comes from restriction. Whether He was restricted in the pit, whether He was restricted in shackles, or whether He was restricted in the prison, there was accountability. What are you doing right now with what God has given you? And the last thing that it produced was excellence. Excellence. Favor, faithfulness. Favor, faithfulness. Hand in hand. It's a closed loop. You, you, throughout Scripture, you, you, you don't have one without the other. They are always together. Even speaking to my dad, I was like, which came first? Was he faithful because he was favored? Or was he favored because he was faithful? Whenever you are diligent and faithful, excellence is a byproduct of your commitment and obedience to what God has called you to. It doesn't matter what it is. Everyone is called to rule and reign. Everyone. Why you are fearfully and one made in his image the fingerprint of god soul spirit body rule and reign in your arena diligence excellence faithfulness favor service comes from humility and cooperation with god and eventually after 13 years of being in the moment, being in the process. It's amazing how sudden the breakthrough was. It's amazing how in an instant, everything changed around him. He wasn't focused on that. I, I, I don't even know if he remembered the dream. Why am I, what got me into this in the first place? And the Lord will remind you and oftentimes it's through the sudden breakthrough of the arrival of the moment that you have been waiting for, preparing for, being equipped for, for your entire process. It was sudden from the prison to the palace, using his gifting once more for the glory of God and saving Egypt from famine and all of those cities around them. The faithfulness that he had with his gift overflowed and affected more than just him. Your calling is bigger than you. Your faithfulness and your blessing affects more than just you. Joseph came to understand that it was never just about him and it was never just about his process and it was never about arriving at the podium. It was never about even crossing the finish line. It was about the things that God placed within him 
through the struggle and through the pain, through the uncertainty, through the questions. If your process brings you to a place where you question the existence of God, do not think that that is the enemy in your life. That is the voice of God saying, I dare you, ask me and watch me reveal myself. Do not be afraid of the scary questions. Be not, do not be afraid of the big prayers. The biggest prayer I have ever prayed in my life other than accepting Jesus into my heart is a simple one. Jesus, use me. Oh, I had no idea the process that was gonna be ushered into my life from those three words. Understand the weight of your calling. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit you with something right now because I feel, I feel like the Lord is saying this. The fruit of your process is the promise. Said and done. It's not about the medal around your neck. It's not about the money in your bank account. It's not about the success in a moment. It's about the diligence. It's about the trench. It's about one breath after another, one step after another. Everything I do, everything I say, every fiber of my being exists to glorify one. My calling is bigger than me. My process is bigger than me. Your process is an inspiration to some, a breakthrough for others. Your process releases something in people that they couldn't have got any other way except through your obedience. It's bigger than you. Joseph had the luxury to play games with his family. After the fact. And what a moment that must have been. God revealed who Joseph would be in the dream. But God used the process to reveal himself. That is the theme. That is the theme of your life. That is the theme of your situation. That will be the theme of your family. That will be the theme of your career. That will be the theme of your marriage. That will be the theme of your existence. God revealed to me who I would become when I stood on the podium. God revealed Himself when I went through the process. Tell you what, man, I have been brought through some stuff. I've had some questions. We all have. Man, I tell you, the reason I praise in church, the reason I come here expecting, is because I know, Lord, if you have me in this process, if you have me on this track, if you narrow my road, if you apply more restriction, if you hold me accountable, who can sway me from my destiny? Who can sway me from your favor? Who can sway me when I am faithful? What I do, I don't do through my own strength, but through Christ who strengthens me. He suffered first. The weight of your calling will be revealed. Your life will be put on the threshing floor. The Lord will throw it up in the air and separate the good from the bad. Oh, and we get panicked. Oh, we get panicked. Lord, my life is up in shambles. This is the process. Believe me, it is far better to spend a moment in the air than a lifetime suffering on the ground. The Lord will separate the wheat from the chaff. Every single poisonous person Every single snaky situation, every single conspicuous situation will be removed from your life. Do not, do not get upset with the Lord when He sends an earthquake. Rejoice in it because it separates that which needs to go and that which needs to stay. And the Lord strengthens that which remains. 
Come on, can we give the Lord a shout of praise this morning? Church, this morning I'm going to leave you with this, and that is when you stand at the finish line, on the podium, in the anointing, with the grace, no, you have been equipped. You are ready. Some things will help for you because you could not understand the responsibility you handle the weight of the blessing that God has given you. To whom much is given, come on, much is required. He is the witness in your life. Your testimony serves more than just yourself. I'm so grateful for the Savior that we serve. I'm so grateful for this house. I'm so grateful for the community that I call home, that I call family. I'm so grateful for City Life Church. I'm so grateful for the process. Lord, whatever you need to do in my life, Take me back. Instill what you need to instill within me. Lord, no matter how painful, no matter the struggle, Lord, when the winds are howling and the waves are big, and I think I'm going to sink, Lord, I pray that my first and only response will be to wake you up in the boat and say, Lord, take a hold. Take my life, Lord. Take this situation. Don't steer me around the storm. Take me through it. I don't want to avoid the troubles. But because of your grace and your mercy, I invite them. Let them come. Let the favor be seen. Let the faithfulness be tested. Let your word rise above all. And let your people be victorious. We are not made to be victims of the process. We are made to be victors in the process. Come on, church. Hallelujah.